things that's becoming rarer and rarer to find is true honor. And you know, there's an authority and there's an authority. We've learned well in the church how to have an authority over devils. We've learned well in the church how to have uh, authority to deal with people's past, to break curses, to do all the Christian stuff we do by authority in the name of Jesus in the church. But you know, tonight I want you to understand that there's an authority that goes beyond that. There's an authority that's needed to establish the kingdom. Amen. Not just cast the devils out of your life, not just get you healed, but an authority that will establish your future. A, a, a great king does not just need authority to be able to take possession of the land. Once he's taken possession of the land, a great king needs great authority to establish his kingdom in the land he now possesses. So it's all very well to talk about possessing the land. But many people, once they have the land, they will not have the authority to know even what to do with the land. Okay. Amen? And so tonight is kind of like, it could be three messages in one. But sometimes it just has to be that way so that I can get a concept across. So it's, I'm not gonna try to give you three messages in one, but believe me, it's three messages. But I want you to get the conclusion. You have to get the three bits to get the conclusion. So I wanna bring you to this place of authority and I want you to understand something that's lacking in the body, something that we need to arrive at to be able to have an authority that is an establishing authority, a maintaining authority, and a kingdom building authority. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I want to say to you tonight that the reason we don't have this authority, or one of the major reasons why we don't have this authority, is because we do not have correct honor in place. Because we do not have correct honor in place, the body is dysfunctional or not working the way it should be. We do not have correct honor in place because we have, many of us have lost the ability to discern what is precious. To be able to honor correctly, you must be able to discern what is precious. The world has an authority that is based on its value system. Authority in the worldly kingdoms work because there's an across the board understood equality of value system. A rand is worth a rand. We know what that's worth in bread. We know what that's worth in bits to the dollar or to the pound or to the euro. If you go to a jeweler, you can go to a jeweler. There's many supermarkets throughout, uh, many uh, uh, malls and jewelers throughout the country. You can go to any of them and what you're gonna pay for a carrot and diamonds or what you're gonna pay for you know, a certain weight of gold is gonna be the same. And so there's a value system that is established in, wor in the world. And because of the equality, because of the understanding of that value system, authority in the world works because authority is tied into people's understanding, people's knowledge of what that value system is. Something is worth X, and everybody understands it to be worth X. Okay, that establishes an authority. We say, how can you say that? How can you do that? So, okay, well, fine. If, if I come around and I found out that you stole five rand from your employer, that case isn't gonna do well in a South African court. They just say, listen, the guy was obviously, obviously underprivileged, he was obviously really hungry and so on. You know, we just let you go with a warning. But if you work for the bank and you embezzle a million, it's a completely different story. So there's an authority that's backed by the understanding of the value system. The, in the kingdom, we need an equality of value system to be able to, an estab to, be able to establish correct authority. Okay, so go with me quickly, and I, I'm gonna give you a lot of word that you will see what I'm saying and you'll be able to put the, th the, 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 the three things together. So I want you to get those three words. So first of all, you can start by this. You can put your hand on your head. You know where your head is? That's good, okay. This is establishing equality. Does everybody know where their head is? 
Okay. So we've, <laughs> that's a good starting point. Put your hand on your head. You've got to listen now. Okay. And say, I am. I am. Oh, that's pathetic. I am. Thank you. This is not a cope conference. I am. I am. Very precious. Very precious. To him. Turn to your neighbor. Say, you are, you are very, precious very precious to me. You wanted to say to him, didn't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Proverbs 24. So we got three words that we're dealing with tonight. The precious honor and authority. Okay. Now first let me just get one concept clear. Some of this stuff is just, you know, some of it, we don't have to read Bibles. Some of it should just be common sense, okay? So, for instance, just in pure logic, I can prove to you that what's precious and honor go together. In a worldly system, if one king walks in this way and he's carrying a chariot full of gold and his wives are all dressed in, you know, many diamonds and there's a hundred fat ladies dancing and following him down the aisle, you know, and in the next door walks another king who's just, you know, He's a tough guy, but he's in brass and he's got a, you know, and he's just got his one beleaguered little wife with him. She's dressed nice, but there's not too many diamonds and stuff. Which king, in a worldly sense, which king are you going to honor? Okay. The one with all the fat ladies. <laughs> Amen. So in a worldly sense, you honor according to the value system, and there's stuff that supports that value system, being namely the wealth and the value of what's precious. What is precious in a worldly system? When somebody, we say, that's precious stones, that's semi-precious stones, amen? What do we do? We, we, you have gold that's one value and gold that's another value. What makes the difference? The purity, and, what, and so what really in the working of it makes the difference? In the working of it, it's the purification that makes the difference. Because the gold that's coming out the ground is probably pretty much the same. But one is purified to a certain level, and one is purified to another level. So what is, the, the more pure it is, the cheaper it gets? No, no, no. The more pure it is, the more expensive it gets. Amen? And so honor is directly tied to the preciousness or the purity of the thing that you value. Amen? So now, we, we're going to talk about this in a kingdom sense and in a worldly sense, but I'm going to show you that it works both ways. It's just what establishes the value system. Because what's precious in a worldly sense, and you've got to get this right now, what's precious in a worldly sense will be subject to decay and subject to change. But what's precious in a kingdom sense should be eternal, but it should be the same to all of us. Amen? So Proverbs 24, 4, we start from 3. It says, through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding... It is established. Hey, hey, hey. There it goes right there. There's a difference between the building or the initiating of an operation. So, do you get me? There's something else needed for an establishment of it. Okay? Through wisdom is a house builded. By understanding it's established. Watch this. By knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. By knowledge shall the chambers be filled. Now let's talk about the chambers quickly. Because right here tonight, and I'm going to introduce many concepts. Don't get lost. I'm not lost. I'll, I'll find you at the end. But 
you know, and I'll tie it together for you. But I've got to introduce a number of concepts. So first of all, let's talk about this building and let's talk about the chambers. Where's the first chamber that we should talk about? A lot of Christians don't know this in, in, in today's world because we've become such an outward seeking people. First of all, we, we, we first and foremost miss God on what should be valuable and precious to Him in our own hearts. Because the first place God is looking for what's precious with you is with what's going on in your heart. So in Song of Songs it says, that the Lord has gone down into his garden to eat of the precious fruits. Where are the precious fruits? So the first place that fruit is being produced is down inside in your inner man. We just see fruit outwardly. Oh, I led so many people to the Lord and I got so many people healed. But really the Bible says, you know, that, that God is examining your heart, that God is busy trying your heart. And so the first place God is looking for what's precious. And can I say what's precious to him should be precious to us? Amen. So the first thing God's looking for is he's looking for, by knowledge, what's valuable and precious is being established in your heart so that God in you. So here's the first chamber. Because you are a temple, we are the temple. Remember Prophet Kubis was saying tonight, there's many of these things that are, you know, allegories and, you know, but there's, you, you can discern truth from a number of different angles in many scriptural things. So, you know, put your hand on your head and say, I am a temple. Put your hand around your neighbor, put your arm around your neighbor, and let's declare together, we are a temple. Actually, we are the temple. Amen. So where's the next place? Okay, so I'm building value in my own life. Okay? By knowledge of God, by the knowledge. See, in the world, you can't be duped. I mean, Prophet Kuba is talking about them Nigerians. You go downtown Hillbrow, I mean, a guy's gonna come up to your window and try to sell you a watch that looks like a... Yeah, but I mean, you can feel my watch tonight. You know, you know that this thing is what it is because if I throw it at you, it's gonna hurt you. But some of them watches, you know, it says the right thing on it, but if I throw it at you from here, it'll fall apart before it hits you. <laughs> okay? So to be able to work with what's precious, you gotta know and understand the value. Amen? And so in the kingdom, it's the same. We have to receive of the Lord. We have to gain the knowledge to be able to find out what is precious. Many people, many Christians all over the world today filling their lives with all sorts of stuff that they esteem to be of a certain value. But when we match that value system of ours up, even though we may call it spiritual, when we match up that value system with what is the real value system of the spirit, will they be equal? Why is it so quiet here now? We're thinking, hallelujah. Okay, go to Matthew chapter six quickly. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter six and verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Now how's that for a twist? Because I just told you that you, through knowledge, have got to begin to fill this chamber with what's precious. But now he's saying that where you've put what's precious is where your heart is gonna be. And God wants your heart to be committed to an inner life in him. Come on. So, We've been taught, and listen, you better believe me, I minister in the township and to mainly youth. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not poor. I'm living okay. Okay, we, 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 we're doing fine. I have an awesome building. No, nobody else can get a building like that in the township where I am. I mean, we do loads of stuff. In under three years, we've led 20,000 people to the Lord. It costs some money to lead 20,000 people to the Lord. Amen? 
okay? We've got all sorts of programs, all sorts of stuff going on. We feed, I mean, for the first year that we started, we fed the church every Sunday. We just fed everybody, you know? So you better listen to me carefully. You better believe that I believe in prosperity. But now I wanna tell you something else. I never in my life ever have sown money for a car. I won't do it. Why? Where your treasure is, your heart is. A car will rust. Come on. A car can be stolen. A car will get much, as they say in Stilfontein. The thing is much. And you can come outside, I'm not driving a scoro scoro. Okay? So I've got faith for finance, and God provides, and you better believe I'm into prosperity. But there's a very simple principle. If you put your money for the car, guess what? Sowing and reaping works. You'll get the car. But your heart will be in the car. But the car is subject to moth, rust, devaluation, theft, okay? So if you sow for a car, even if you live 400 years, you'll always be sowing for a car. But there's a way to sow that you'll always have a car and never have to sow for another car. You understand? So we need to have treasure where? In heaven, meaning we need to have treasure in the kingdom. So if you sow for what's earthly, sowing and reaping will work, but you will tie yourself into a continuous cycle of what's earthly. And if that is where you investing, then that's where your treasure is, then that's where your heart will be, then your heart will continually be stuck battling to come into a kingdom dimension and a kingdom reality, and so you will struggle always to perceive what is truly spiritually of value. You will struggle to discern what's precious to him. Whereas if you always giving your money just for the kingdom, you don't, you don't care if it comes back to you, but you're investing there. So you're sowing into riches and glory. You're sowing into the kingdom. You're continuously sowing into the place of reciprocation because there's no rust, there's no theft, there's no rot there. It doesn't grow old. So does he not say all these things will follow you. Because he says all these things will follow you, he doesn't say don't sow. But you need to store up for yourself treasures in heaven, meaning you need to build your treasure in the kingdom dimension. Because in the kingdom dimension, let me tell you something, where does the Bible say Jesus had faith? He was born king of kings and lord of lords. He had perfect authority. He had the ability to do. You need faith to bring you to the ability. There's many things I do in my Christian life now every day. I don't use faith. I've, faith brought me to the place of understanding and the ability to be able to get it. Now I just keep getting it. I don't need to keep exercising faith to get there. I just live there. Once you've accomplished that place, you don't, faith gets you there. But once faith has got you there, the power of God will maintain you there. Hallelujah. Okay, so Matthew 13, 44. You all know it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in the field. When the man hath found it, he hides it again. For joy thereof, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. So Luke 12, 33. I like it here. You guys are are like real quick at getting through the Bible, you know? I just hear the pages, and we're there. Some churches, Luke 12, 33, it's Luke 12, 33. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce you to another concept. And what we're just going to do is we're going to put line upon line, precept upon precept, concept upon concept. So you're going to be able to perceive something at the end of the night that's going to break you through in your life. Okay. 
And so um, I want you to understand that in order then to do something kingdom, you need to have a resource that's kingdom. One of the things Charles Finney used to say was, is God a worse investor than your bank manager? Now some of you, very, some of you think I'm, this is a financial message tonight. That's the wisdom of my wife to tell you this is how to get rich. <laughs> but I'm gonna finish you off somewhere else, okay? But Charles Finney used to say, is the Lord a worse investor than your bank manager? Will your bank manager invest his money in your project that you don't put your own money in? And so Charles Finney used to say, how dare you think that you can ask God to support what you won't put all you have into? Come on. Do you understand? The guy finds the treasure and he hides it and buries it because I gotta have this whole thing established in my heart. Then I commit myself completely and totally to that thing because I cannot lose because I know it's a treasure that cannot grow old. It's a treasure that cannot lose value. Everything else, man, you can have faith for it, good for you, but one day somebody can still take it. <laughs> it's a statistical fact in the world today that there's an 89% chance that you in your lifetime will be involved in a war. The fact that you're a Christian, let's not be naive tonight, does not preclude you from the fact that you may end up 20 years from now with a very different life situation than what you have right now. And you may not be able to change that. Somebody else may forcefully, suddenly change your value system for you. When that happens, you better have a value system that allows your faith and love to stay grounded in what's real value. Come on. So, here's the reality, okay? To be able to do something in the kingdom, you've gotta have something in the kingdom. So when we decide to do stuff in the kingdom, my wife and I have learned, we put everything we have in the flesh into it. Not because we trying to get something in the kingdom. We started doing that long ago. You better have started doing that long ago. The main reason people don't get something done in the kingdom is because they don't have the resource to do it. Come on, man, everybody here tonight, has got something great they wanna do for Jesus. Out in TV land, every believer, every, I don't care if I'm speaking to millions of people, everybody has some vision of doing something great for Jesus. The principal reason most people don't ever do it is because they don't ever have the resource to do what they wanna do. Most people can't go into the ministry they want because they're too fearful to even leave the job they have. So to do something because he says, I'll provide for you through my riches in glory. He doesn't say I'll provide for you through your business plan. Amen? So watch this. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. If you go down to Luke 18, there was a rich young ruler and he wanted to know from, from the Lord, he wanted to know from Jesus, you know, how, how, how do I come to this perfection how, how, how do I arrive at this place? How do I come to full spiritual maturity? And Jesus asked him a question. He said, go and keep the law. Go and keep the whole law. Jesus wasn't enforcing the law by telling him to go and keep the law. That's where most people get lost and why you can't understand what's really happening in this, in, 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 in this little story. So immediately after that, the guy says this. He says, I've done that from the time I've been young. And Jesus says this to him. He says, when he heard this, he said to him, yet lackest thou one thing, Luke 18, 22. Yet you lack one thing. Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And that's what you've been reading for most of your life. But that's not what he said. This is what he said. He said, sell what you have, give the money to the poor, 
and then you will have riches in heaven and you can come and follow me. Meaning what? Without riches in heaven, you can't follow me. So the Bible says the man was exceedingly sorrowful because he had great wealth. But you wanna know what's sorrowful? Here's the man's real sorrow. Watch this. I've kept the law my whole life and it's earned me nothing in glory. So Jesus is not saying to him, I want your stuff and then you can be this disciple. Jesus is saying to him, I can show you how to make one quick investment that will put you in the position where you'll be able to follow. So I've been making those investments all my life. I don't have to give my stuff away now. I don't have to give anything. I'm not compelled. I'm compelled by love to do everything I do. So I keep working on my heart and out of my heart, I'm building what's precious to him in my life. And you can't take it away. Nobody can take it away. Nobody can touch it because I live on a value system that's established in the kingdom of heaven. You understand? So many people, that, here's, a, here's a great check. If you were an auditor for kingdom value and what's precious in the kingdom right now, you should know by looking back over your life what are the things that have been an investment that's giving you stuff that can be a resource to a kingdom operation. So God sincerely wants to endorse the value that's on your life. I wanna tell you now, we gotta get this before we get to the next level, level of the miraculous. Prophet Kubis and I talk about it often. We, we know that we're on the very threshold of a time when we're gonna see the greatest miracles that the body of Christ has ever seen. But I'm telling you now, what I'm talking about tonight is one of the keys to getting to that place, okay? Because when God does a miracle through you, God's advertising God on you. How, how can God say, this is God, see the miracle, see my love, and then people come to you and find a value system that's just like the world's? How can you say, God uses me to do a great miracle, now all the world's eyes on me. The Bible says Jesus went down into Galilee, started doing good works, and a fame of him spread round about. But when they came to him, what was the value they found? The love of God. What if the world receives and sees a miracle through your life but looks over your wall and sees the same values in your backyard as they have in their backyard? That's confusion. Amen. Right, so 1 Peter 1, well, I just wanna go actually to, to, to this scripture that the trial of your faith, and I gotta try and catch up some time here because we wanna do the whole thing and I don't want to, go long, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now I believe, I believe that I'm in the right place. I don't believe I have to preach here because otherwise we have gotta go back, we have gotta have 10 services to get you arrived there. So that I'm, I know that I'm in a church now where you understand that that scripture does not mean when Jesus comes again. That scripture means at the manifestation of Christ in you, at the appearing of Christ through you. It's an appearing when somebody else sees it. Not when it happens to you, it's an appearing when somebody else sees, oh, that, you, you know, the world should sit on the pavement, watch the church and walk by and say, Emmanuel, God is with us, because the only way the world still gets to see God is with you is when they see God in you. Amen. 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 Right, so, so our trial, the trial of our faith should bring glory and honor to God when the appearing of Jesus, the manifestation of Jesus is taking place in you. And so what's precious must be transferred because this trial of your faith is a purifying. So it's making something precious happen in you. It's getting your value system sorted out, not producing the miracle. He produced the ability for the miracle on the cross, but now he's got to produce in you the ability to be the carrier of that miracle that the value system is the same. 
You know what we do in our church? Every Sunday morning, whatever, every service, we have an altar call. Every altar call, we ask everybody that gets saved, do you have a place to stay? Do you have food? How dare you lead somebody to Jesus, but then when the service is over, tell them, God bless you, may the force be with you. <laughs> Bye-bye now. See you next Sunday. Hope you make it. You know? We don't have, in our, in, in our church, most of the people call me prophet, and, and I don't care what you call me, you can call me chief foot washer for all I care. But we, we, we have a very prophetic ministry, but we don't have this thing of little personal words and, and whatnot and whatnot on the floor of our church. Do you know why? We've told people straight. We say, how dare you think you have the ability to talk or speak into somebody's life without demonstrating that your love for them would cause you to have a walk with them in their life. It's very easy to run around. I mean, come on, man. I'm a, I'll puke if somebody else comes and tells me they see a large ship coming into harbor. You know? Aren't we all tired of ships coming into harbor? And co Come on, man. You know? We need something real to happen. If you come and give me a word, what's more valuable to me than that word is to know what I mean to you and how you can stand with me, and how you can walk with me. Come on, God's raising a family here, people. Amen. Amen. We don't have to take what's cheap anymore. And so the trial of our faith is producing in us what's incredibly valuable. Now you miss something in that scripture, watch this. It says, the trial of your faith, being more precious than gold, you, know, you haven't got it, watch. That perishes, though it be tried with fire. You know what it's saying? It's saying exactly what I've been saying to you all night. Even the gold that's tried in a fire, in other words, it's saying this. It's saying the purest you can physically make gold. It's still subject to decay. But the trying of your faith is more precious than that. In other words, once he's worked in you what's precious, it's not subject to decay. Mende. <laughs> Hallelujah. So go to 1 Peter and 1 and 22. Seeing. In other words, it's talking about something that I've got to see. It's talking about something that there's a manifestation of. Okay? You have purified your souls in obeying the truth, how? Through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for one another out of a pure. In other words, what have you been doing? You've been busy storing in your heart what's precious. You've been building precious kingdom stuff in your heart. Okay? Because of that, you're learning. That thing says, says unfeigned. The word unfeigned means basically non-discriminational. What does that tie right back to? It ties right back to you receive honor of one another. I see because you still receive honor from one another that you don't believe. That's discrimination. Because you're sitting here and you're judging. You say, oh no. I mean, I remember, you know, when I was in, in, in high school, I, when I was in standard eight, you know, this young little blondie came into standard six. And for me then, you know, oh, she was cute. Eh? And, you know, but she didn't want have anything to do with me, you know. So I figured out a way how to get into her circle, man. I made friends with her friends. And before long, I was a lot closer. How rude is that? What a horrible thing for those friends who, if they now, watching TV, found out all those years ago, I have to repent, forgive me, guys, you know? All those years ago, they found out, man, that guy didn't like us at all. He was just befriending us because he's trying to get in the circle of this little girl. So is it a nice thing to be on the receiving end of discriminatory honor? We only been worried in this country about honor that's derogatory. But I want to tell you what, positive honor in the worldly sense when it's honor of man is just as much a problem. Amen. And so, but as I'm purifying my heart, I'm able to have non-discriminatory love. 
In other words, I'm not looking, ooh, do I like you? Ooh, that's somebody. I don't wanna, you know, the, you know what happened to me the minute God touched my heart many, many years ago? I found that people that had problems began to magnetize towards me. I wanna tell you now, if people that have got issues, people that others, let me say it this way, if people that others don't want to walk with don't come to you, then you haven't been doing with your heart what you're supposed to be doing with your heart. I found everybody, man, I tell you what, if, if I can walk in the shopping center, if there's a demoniac in the place, he will make his way to me. You, you, you see, we've learned deliverance. Oh, you just judge the poor person. But don't you know there's a possessed soul that's desperately crying out for love and freedom? You just wanna see the devil. Some of these ministries just showcasing their deliverance stuff. No care at all for the people that are getting set free. I don't think if I got set free in a church like that, I could ever love God. God is so gracious that so much good happens outside of those things. But I tell you what, if we got right what we're supposed to get right, a whole lot more would be happening. Amen. Okay, and so watch this. Seeing you have purified your soul. So here I am, what am I? I'm a soul that gets saved. When I speak in tongues, it's a manifestation of the fact that I have a living spirit. Amen. And I believe in whole man salvation, spirit, mind, body. You know, your, your body must come into divine life just as your soul must. But first we are those, Paul says, who don't draw back but believe unto the saving of the soul. So the first thing we want getting purified is the soul, amen. Because the soul is what's tied to the heart. And the heart is what's manifesting because the Bible says we can see what treasure is in your heart by what you speak. Are you starting to tie all these things together with honor and purity and, and what's precious and what's valuable to him? So he says, I can see, seeing, I can see that your soul is being purified by your non-discriminatory love of one another. So the trouble is we haven't been able to get pure because the people that came before us tried to teach us how to come to purity by applying the law to ourselves. And the more you apply the law to yourself, so come on, here's a great key. This is a whole service on its own. There's a, there's a great revelation right now that you can take for yourself. How do you begin to purify yourself? Those who want to be pure, those who want to establish themselves in what's precious, how do you begin? Start working with your heart till you are able to lose all this honor of men and receiving honor of men. Come into a position of true faith, a faith that is a preciousest being worked in you that cannot be subject to decay that even gold, even gold that's tried in a fire is still subject to. But this trying of your faith is producing in you what is most precious and cannot be subject to, pay, to, to, to decay. Bringing you to the place where this preciousness in your heart allows you to begin a purification process that is evidenced, witnessed, manifest in your life through your non-discriminatory love of one another. Are you, are you, are you? Getting something? Is this cool? Yeah. Amen. We want, we want change. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, we, 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 we're nearly done. And we're just gonna tie this up for you. So, so awesome. 1 Corinthians 12. And we'll start from 13 or even 11. But all these works that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, for as the body is one and as many members and all the members of that one body being many or one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, we've been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, 
I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Da, 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 we go on. Let's just jump down quickly to 22. He says, name much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, even these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another. And now he goes on and he ties this all together. And as you guys well know in this church, at the end of the chapter, he puts body gifts, ministry gifts, and spiritual gifts all together and then talks about love and coming to a maturity in love that basically expires those, or not expires, but uh, uh, basically it, it, it promotes beyond the level of operating in those things. Amen. So there's a place that we come to in love that promote, promotes beyond operating in those things. Okay, and, I, and I've stood for that for many years and I know that you believe it, I know that it's here. I've, I've heard Prophet Quibus preach it not so long ago. Okay, but now here's a thing, see, that I wanna deal with that goes to the summation of this message. The New Testament, well, you know, most of, Particularly the flakes, you know, running around calling themselves prophets. They just love all the revelation out of the Old Testament. But there's more revelation in the New Testament with a greater power and specifically pertaining to us now and the establishment of the kingdom. Amen? And listen to me. The New Testament is just a very small amount of writing in comparison to what we have in the Old Testament. That should say something to you about the surgical, prophetic accuracy of everything that's spoken. And if that's true, then we can't take for granted that a better part of a chapter is taken up by Paul the describing the positioning of body parts to us. So there's got to be something in this that we need to take note. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing, see, I don't know about you, but I don't eat with my feet on the table. Anybody here? I eat with my hands. My hands and my feet hold very different places in the earth. My hands can reach to God. Do you know the other day I was doing a study when I was, doing, when I was reading some cosmology stuff and whatnot, Basically, every geometric shape can be, can, can be mimicked with your hand and your fingers together. There's, your hands are so multidimensional with your fingers. And just think about the product of the work of your hands. Your feet are not that dexterous. But you'll have a bit of a problem doing those artworks with your hands if your feet weren't firmly planted on the soil. Amen. Do we all agree that our hands and our feet are very different? If you don't believe me, you can come smell. <laughs> Would you tend to honor the ability and function of your hands more than you would honor the ability and function of your feet? Basically, yes, you would. But here's where the problem comes in. We have churches whole churches and whole bodies and whole Christian organizations that are founded on principles that won't allow the hands to wash the feet because the feet are not good enough for the hands. Come on. I don't put my feet where I put my hands. But if I won't use my hands to wash my feet, this whole body is gonna be in trouble. If I take your one eye, you can still see. If I shut your mouth, you can still write. But if you have stomach problems, you can only stand in one place and go, mm. <laughs> What's precious to Jesus? 
what's precious to Jesus. So can you see the link? Because what we've been honoring has been giving us a confused and non-kingdom value system. The sickness begins in the heart, in the inability for us to have put pure and kingdom stuff in our heart. And so because of that, we make ourselves like unbelievers. We make it very difficult for ourselves to believe because we still receive honor of men and honor men and give love with discrimination. But the minute you see somebody that is loving without discrimination, you know that they're in the process of developing a purified soul. That's the work of a faith that's being purified. Something precious is being produced that's of everlasting value to him. That value system has the ability to honor correctly. Now my hands wash my feet. Now one part of the body never says I'm better than that part of the body. Now we have a body that's operating with correct honor. Authority comes to establish kingdom. So I'll read one scripture and just this will some and I just want to hear the I, w- I want you just just hear this and and hear probably you've never seen this scripture this way if you just go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 are you not yet carnal from verse 3 are you not yet fleshly in other words are you not still established on a worldly value system <laughs> whereas there is Amongst you envy and strife and divisions, is it not that you are carnal and still walking like men? For while one says I'm of Paul and another Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then's Paul? Who's Apollos? But ministers by whom you believe. Now watch this, he says, I've planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now watch where this goes. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. What did I start, to talk? What did I start talking about? Authority for the establishment of this building. Amen. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds thereon. But every man take heed how he builds. For no other foundation can any man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds upon this foundation, watch here it comes, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, seeings ye have purified, your work will be made manifest, okay? For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, faith, huh? purified by fire, <laughs> And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereon, he will receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defiles the temple. So in other words, here we're building the temple. Faith purified so that souls are purified through love that doesn't discriminate. So we're discerning what's precious, so we're honoring what's precious to God, so we're building works, as we build the temple together, we're building works of gold and silver, and because we're putting one another together in the correct value system of what's precious. Hallelujah. Amen. And then I'm living a life where I know that the kingdom isn't going to fail me because I've lived a life where you and I are establishing kingdom. Now I don't have to stand in front of my church and say, there's no recession in the kingdom, but meantime, yesterday, I retrenched half my staff. 
Now I know that everything I build, I build through what's precious to him from resources that have been established there. Because God is establishing a kingdom that will not fail. You don't have to fight the kingdoms of the world. They have the seed of decay in them. They will end. But we need to establish the kingdom for our own good as soon as possible. It will go on and on and on and on and on and on because it has the seed of eternal life in it. But it's you that gets to choose whether you live in it or you maintain yourself subject to decay because you have built your heart around a value system that's subject to decay. Honor is tied to that. It works both ways. And if you have that right, you will honor correctly then you will be day by day by day with one another establishing what's precious. Somebody here tonight has been called a long time ago to go do what's precious, but you bought into a value system that got sold to you from the world rather than the kingdom. Because of that, you haven't touched who you were supposed to touch. Somebody tonight has not seen Jesus yet because somebody that hasn't honored correctly would not go. Somebody tonight has had no appearing of Jesus Christ in their life because somebody's faith would not allow what is precious to be formed in their life so that they could honor correctly so that they could be involved where they're supposed to be involved. I'm standing here talking to you tonight and I don't have a foot attached to the top of my head and my eyes are not on my kneecaps. And there's somebody here tonight who has lost all the value of ministry because they had to be a mouth. Meantime, God says, I made you to be a leg. That was awesome. But because you were determined to have to hang around with the eyes and the ears because you're a mouth, you have messed up your whole ministry because you haven't even honored yourself correctly. Hallelujah. And all we have to do is come tonight and say, Lord, fix my value system. Try my faith. Teach me love. You know, I, I, I minister around quite a bit of the world. And I, you know what I find about Christians at the moment? They'll run everywhere looking for the next species of goosebump. And I believe in the anointing and I believe in signs and wonders and I'm with all the manifestations. Man, when God moves, it's powerful and people feel the move of God. Hallelujah. But somewhere along the line, what's valuable to him needs to become an establishing power and authority amongst us and become a lot more than I experienced the new wow. Because there's a wow beyond that when we start loving one another right.